I'm really excited to officially welcome you to today's webinar, an inside look with the California Department of Water Resources. Bill, thank you so much for being here. We're, we're really glad to have you, and this is going to be a great conversation. To kick it off, I want to share a little bit about us. Libris empowers effortless visual storytelling, both through our digital asset management tools and through resources like this webinar series. We're excited about this new Inside Look series where people are taking us behind the scenes into their visual media libraries, telling us how they use our tools to get organized, to to share their assets with everybody on their team. And in Bill's case, share assets with everybody from social media and PR to internal engineers who need their images for historical records. It's gonna be a really interesting conversation. And with that, I wanna officially welcome our guest, Bill Kelly. You are the media librarian for photography and visual units at the California Department of Water Resources. Um, Bill's gonna give us a look into his team's workflow um, and how they archive photos dating back to the 1950s and then how they turn around photos really quickly. He's gonna share some images that were actually shot yesterday and then used yesterday in social media and PR. So really cool to see both their, um, you know, breaking news workflow as well as how they share those um, images that are archive images, even some digitized slides. So I think we're going to get a little preview of that too. Um, and their archive is incredible. Bill's going to walk us through some really interesting stories um, that his team has collected over the years and preserved and that they're using to, you know, both inform their engineers and share with the public um, and entertain Californians and people all over the world. Um, so, Bill, thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to have you and we can't wait for this conversation. All right. Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be in the Libris world. Uh, as Kristen said, I'm Bill Kelly III, actually. I'm the photo unit media librarian for the California Department of Water Resources. Here in uh, sunny California, here in the suburbs of Sacramento, it's 11.05, not 11, not 11 o'clock, because <laughs> we're all facing these challenging times through the COVID-19 public health emergency. I've been tele working since March 18 with uh, two scanners, an old school, as you can see, a 35 millimeter Nikon cool scan uh, and a Pacific Image 120 Pro for two and a quarter scanning with the ViewScan interface software. Plus, at my disposal are several thousand 35 millimeter slides pulled from our archive to be examined for content, condition, and value for scanning. Our DWR team of three photographers and a shooter supervisor and myself are all former newspaper photographer and picture editors. Ken James, our supervisor, is from Australia and worked at the Sydney newspaper. Florence Lowe and Kelly Grow worked on California newspapers. And our newest hire, starting in May, worked in Florida and Texas. And myself, I worked in Virginia, Tennessee, and South Carolina. DWR has been a Libris user since the fall of 2016 with our site, Pixel, as you can see. The transition to Libris was flawless with its simple design, intuitiveness, and, and its collection and gallery architecture, which we have created over 200 separate galleries. First, let me give you a brief history of the California Department of Water Resources. Like many Libris users, we're not a sports franchise or a Fortune 500 company, but a state agency that supports, um, but a state agency that manages the water resources for nearly 27 million Californians in Northern and Southern California, the Bay Area and the San Joaquin Valley and the Central Coast via the State Water Project that's then distributed by 29 long-term water supplier contractors. Plus the State Water Project provides water for 750,000 acres of farmland. In 2018, California farms and ranches received almost $50 billion in cash receipts for their output, which makes up for one third of the US vegetables and two thirds of the country's fruits and nuts. Oh. As you can see, some of the uh, vegetables that are, that are in our website, and here's from a lemon tree. 
But the state faces unique natural challenges. Uh, during the calendar year, our weather is broken into two distinct seasons, the long and dry season that runs from April through November, which can lead to droughts. For, for example, the five-year event from 2012 to 2016, the water levels at Lake Oroville were extremely low, as you can see in this iconic image. And then Governor Jerry Brown issued a state of emergency to manage water and habitats, which included water restrictions for watering lawns, including here at the grass at the state capitol complex. Dry and hot seasons also have led to the, the growing fire seasons here in California. As many of you remember the Paradise Fire from about a year and a half ago. But DWR also helped with a, a joint agency agreement with fire, uh, CAL FIRE photographed this uh, fire in uh, the East Bay Hills area where the fire destroyed over 3,000 structures and 25 lives were lost in the hills overlooking Berkeley and Oakland. And also during the drought of the early 90s, so the snowpack um, was nearly gone on Mount Shasta near the California and Oregon border. And then the wet season that starts in November and gets kicking in December and January and February, especially during uh, good wet years with rain and snow. The snowfall in the Sierra Nevada mountains is measured in not in inches and is a saving grace for much of the water needs for its customers that are served by DWR's mission. For centuries, the streams in California can uh, run uncontrolled and during the wet season, large areas become wetlands, especially in the Sacramento, San Joaquin and Central Valleys. The wide expanse of land between the Sierra Nevada mountains to the east and the coastal mountain range to the west. Here's a perfect example. This is an image we got from the California State Library. It shows uh, a street, K Street in Sacramento, where horse and buggies have been replaced by boats. And if you can imagine trying to get to your hotel room by ladder up here onto the second floor. <laughs> so that shows you how. Uh, the water that hits uh, the area during the winter months can have a devastation and it would spread across the valleys and a wasteland of water. And here's from flooding in 1997 showing aerial photography that we captured. It's amazing to see the range in your library from 1861 to 1997 to today. It's really, Absolutely. really cool. And here's, uh, here's an image from uh, 2017 showing actually it was the wettest uh, year on record and uh, and some of the areas in southern Sacramento County were flooded. So in, in 1956, the California State Legislature established the Department of Water Resources to protect, to conserve, develop and manage the state water's supply. The State Water Project became the nation's largest state-built water conveyance program to transport water from the Sierra Mountains in Plumas County all the way to the flatlands of Riverside County in Southern California. Today, it includes 34 storage facilities, 20 pumping plants, five hydroelectric power plants, four pumping generating plants, and over 700 miles of canals, tunnels, and pipelines, getting the water to 27 million users. Much of our photography resides in our Pixel Libris Library, shows the State Water Project. DWR hired its first photographers in their early years to photograph detailed construction images of the State Water Project for the agency's engineers. Those were captured on four by five cameras in the late 50s to the mid 70s, and then converted to two and a quarter size cameras, mostly captured in black and white, and sprinkled in between with 35 millimeter color slides. The work started in the foothills of the Sierras in the Oroville area with the construction of the new railroad lines, tunnels and highway bridges to make way for the Oroville uh, Dam, the cornerstone of the state water project, which the earth filled dam would stand 720 feet tall from their Feather River riverbed. And here's an example of one of the new bridges that were built and the train line that was, uh, that was replacing the old for uh, the construction of the Oroville Dam. Here's one of the bridges that today, if uh, Oroville uh, Reservoir and Dam was filled with a max amount of water would, would be near the very top of the concrete pilings to hold the bridge up. So you can imagine that's how much water 
uh, is filled in the Oroville uh, Reservoir. Here's uh, showing some of our construction imagery of uh, building the concrete core block for the Oroville Dam, the foundation of the of the, of the dam. Uh, this is an aerial shot showing that same scene of the Feather River in the in the beginning structure. There's the core block being built there. Part of the uniqueness about uh, the Oroville Dam is an earth-filled dam, and uh, dirt and rock from other parts of Butte County were transported by rail, and they were put in this device that could dump up to 45 cars per hour, 10,000 tons of material, which was then put on a conveyor belt that was transported up to the dam site. By 1964, um, the dam was about halfway finished, as you can see here in this uh, photograph made in November. But by December, uh, huge heavy rains would hit and flooding would affect, and two diversion uh, tunnels were built to alleviate the water behind the construction of the dam so it wouldn't top over the dam and water was was released into the Feather River. Uh, it's pretty amazing the amount of energy being released from the water. By 1967, uh, they were photographing the beginning of building of the spillway and here's the beginning of the showing the, the gate area that was being built. And by September 67, the, the dam was nearly finished. And by on March 4th, uh, I mean, May 4th, I'm sorry, in uh, 1968 was the dedication. And Governor Ronald Reagan uh, was there to uh, speak to the folks. This is an amazing picture of resolution. Uh, this is shot with a four by five color negative, which was a rarity uh, within our archive. And the resolution, when you think about it, would be comparable to seeing an IMAX uh, movie, the resolution of this picture, we could blow up this picture uh, to a massive size and, and the picture wouldn't fall apart. Uh, here's an aerial shot showing that same dedication uh, shot with a four by five showing the 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 crowd gathered and the Oroville Dam in the distance. Construction continued on in the state water project to the southern part of the state. And this is in uh, Santa Bernardino County, uh, the building of the Cedar Springs Dam. And by 1973, uh, Governor uh, Ronald Reagan is there for the dedication for the Paris Dam, which is in Riverside County. And beside him is as a longtime friend, Casper Weinberger, who at the time was director of the Office of Management for the Nixon administration. But Reagan would appoint him to become his Secretary of Defense during his administration. And here shows part of the 10,000 people that came out to the event for the dedication. So you can imagine at that time, what this meant to the people uh, in Riverside County, uh, the idea of getting water all the way from uh, the northern part of California. And here's an aerial shot showing Paris Dam uh, in 1973. And here it is in 2014, how suburbia of Los Angeles and San Diego has spread east right to the foundation of Paris Dam. Here's one of the, as I would call a hidden treasures, one of the uniqueness of my, about my job as the media librarian is finding all kinds of cool little stories. And here is uh, sort of an innocent uh, photograph uh, as people are standing for the groundbreaking of the, of the Antelope Dam in Plumas County and everyone's standing for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And what's really interesting is on this stage, there's one woman here and I kept wondering, who is this woman? And and, and part of that same day, uh, we had a black and white picture of her getting ready to uh, push the plunger for a blast charge for the beginning <laughs> of the construction for the dam. And who is this woman? But as we were preparing to telework uh, because of the virus, I found a slide of her. And I knew that I could probably zoom in with her name tag and find out who this lady was. And to find out, she is Pauline Davis, who was a California State uh, Assembly member from the second district, which is where these dams were being built. She held on to her seat for 24 years. Her husband actually had won the election in 1951 and 52, and he passed away. She inherited his, his uh, seat and continued on being reelected up until the mid 1970s. And during the early 60s, she was the only woman in 120 members of the legislature. 
she was a key figure in DWR's construction of the Upper Feather River uh, project involving those three dams. And she was involved in the Davis uh, Dewick Act, which involved in making sure that fish and wildlife and recreation would be in part and built in within the state water project. And many people labeled her the first lady of water. And that's just an amazing story. And there she is seated beside the director of the Department of Water Resources um, at this event. Uh, this is actually two years later at the dedication of that same dam where she was two years earlier getting ready to set off the first charge. So it's just, that's one of the cool things about this job, finding these little hidden treasures. But part of our job here, uh, DWR's mission is, uh, managing the water resources in cooperation with other agencies and the benefits of the state for uh, to protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments, but it's also to respond to floods, droughts, and catastrophic events. And many of our photographers have captured these events, but this picture here was actually made by the United States Air Force from Bill Air Force Base, which is near where this happened in Yuba City, Marysville. It's this area is about 30 miles um, to the west of Oroville Dam. And before the dam was built, uh, these areas, there was no way to control flooding. And, and this is a scene captured on Christmas Day. And that was, uh, this is like almost a scene you can imagine from uh, It's a Wonderful Life if Jimmy Stewart was running down the street um, in this small town of Americana. And, and here it is flooded. Um, and uh, so part of our work uh, for DWR is capturing these floods. Uh, here's another, what I would call what a, almost like a life magazine type of documentary picture of two guys who are working as life, uh, they work on levee patrols as water rises during flooding. They're there to patrol the levees to make sure that if there is a break, they can radio to get, uh, to get help. And here they are filling up a sandbag. Here is in 1964, another uh, group of people were involved in uh, filling sandbags to protect an area along uh, an island in the uh, Delta area, south of uh, Sacramento. In 1972, there was a levee break, another area in the Delta, uh, and we had a photographer right there as they were checking out these homes uh, in this community. And another levee break in 1986. We all remember what happened in New Orleans, uh, the levees break there, but levees have always been fragile and uh, the possibilities of breakage. And here's from a flood in 1986. Also part of that same flood, Oroville Dam had to release, the first time they released 150,000 cubic feet of water per second down the spillway as they would go down and hit, and, uh, and these huge mist clouds would be formed. Uh, at the base of the, of the dam. Uh, also flooding in, uh, in a northern suburb of uh, Sacramento in 1986. Here's a, another unique story, 1997. Here's a photograph uh, showing a trailer park community that had been hit in Manteca, California, which is about 50 miles south of Sacramento. And for about th two or three decades, uh, DWR had mislabeled where this photograph was actually made. Um, they had identified it in, in a different location. And part of my success of being the media librarian is, is using Google Earth and Google satellite imagery. Uh, there's another corresponding photograph that I'm showing today, but I was able to pinpoint because the trailer park was in like a uh, built in a sort of a circle of formation. And I was able through satellite imagery, find out exactly where this picture was made. And I was able to identify it for the first time, the correct location of where this uh, photograph was made. We also have photographer 80 miles north capturing uh, inside people's homes that were affected by the flooding in 1997. Wildlife, uh, as they go through this uh, orchard, uh, this is where a levee had broken in Yuba County. And part of when a levee breaks, you also want to be there when they're capturing, trying to restore it, trying to rebuild the levee back. And we were capturing that. And then in 2004, another levee break in the Delta area. 
these are reoccurring events, but thank goodness uh, a lot of that has been uh, has been fixed after Katrina. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger at the time with federal funding, a lot of these levies were restored and strengthened, uh, and there has not been any levy breaks since then. And here they are preparing to put the piping together to pump the water out of the area that had been had been flooded. That's part of the same community that was affected by that levee break. And then also is covering droughts. Um, this is where we would regularly go to their different reservoir and show the water levels. Here is at Mount uh, at uh, Shasta Lake, which is a federal facility, but we always capture those water levels. And here's that iconic image uh, from Oroville in, 19, in 2014 showing the water levels, uh, how uh, most of the water had uh, had been released and there was not enough water being released by snow or rainfall in the Sierras to, to refill the reservoir. Uh, this is Folsom Dam, which is uh, in a northern suburb area of, uh, of Sacramento. And uh, it's a federal facility, but showing what would normally be water, it almost looks like a desert scene. Another drought in, 2000, in 1976 in an area north of San Francisco, uh, showing the, the classic cracked dirt and a fish that didn't survive, obviously. And then the, our last drought season uh, in 2016, we went to Southern California to Griffith Park, where trees are being distressed by the drought. And, and you guys know Griffith Park is where the Griffith Observatory is. If any of you guys saw the movie La La Land, a famous scene, there's this uh, sort of uh, dream scene that happens at the observatory, and it's also where uh, the film A Rebel Without a Cause uh, was, was filmed. So that shows how we cover different events. But, yeah. but the most so we're getting a bunch of questions from yes. the audience already. So I wanted to go ahead and jump in because I think it really fits nicely with this se section of your talk. Um, you know, everybody's curious about how you organize all of this history. Um, and we've gotten some specific questions about your metadata. Those captions are amazing. And you guys are clearly preserving both the images themselves, but also the stories behind them. And the, the fact that you uncovered that story of the first lady of water and, you know, found all of this context. Um, and you're preserving those those stories alongside the images. Can you talk a little bit more about your process? Um, who writes those captions was one of the questions that we got. Is it just all on you? Or are there other people helping you out with this? Um, just tell us, kind of walk us through your process. Well, with our with our newest imagery, it's it's by the photographers themselves. And remember, we're ex former uh, newspaper photographers, and and part of our jobs as journalists is is to provide good basic information about the stories we're telling with our imagery and that's just inherent with our journalism training to uh to gather that information and provide that information with our with our imagery so the new images are captured by as i said from folks that's just part of their training part of who they are part of their dna as photographers for the historical images that pretty mostly has fallen on myself um, and uh, I, I was a picture editor for about 25 years. And many times you went back and, and beefed up captions written by photographers. So that was inherent with me, but uh, I never knew how much of, a, as I call myself, a Sherlock Holmes um, in, in trying to discover the meaning of our pictures. Because most of our, our archive images files have only just a date, a photographer's name, and a location. And for me, just to put a picture up with no information other than a location would have no context to the importance of what it was that was happening at that moment. And um, so I find myself uh, digging into the research uh, from satellite imagery to our, uh, going back through DWR bulletin reports, uh, sure. looking at newspaper articles. I've actually called uh, community libraries for resource uh, resource information, and so I reach out to the community for people um, who may know more than I. I did move to California to 2015, so I I have very little history within me from experiencing these events. So I have to contact people 
and do a lot of reading to gather that information. Mm -hmm. And I know that captions are really important to your team and you use AP style captions, but what about keywords? We had a question about, did you ask staff, you know, what they were going to be searching for to inform your keyword strategy? Uh, how did you guys decide what kind of keywords to use? Uh, basically, it's uh, photographers uh, desire to provide as many keywords as possible. Um, we actually, our design team encourages to add uh, levels of keywords related to, to color, uh, mm -hmm. like this particular photograph here, uh, we're talking about that Florence Lowe had made. Um, she taught, she just used trees, environment, drought, distressed trees, but I could have maybe added uh, evergreens because a pine tree is an evergreen. I might have added uh, blue for blue sky, um, green because some of their searching may be by color situations they're looking for an element within the design. So those are things that we have to think about uh, adding keywords and uh, but mostly it's relied on on us in within the photo unit to create those keywords. Great. And we're getting a lot of questions about how you guys organize your file structure. Um, so in terms of your collections and galleries, is that something that you can show us so that people can get a feel for how you put that together? Uh, yes. Uh, let me just see if I can go back here. Sure. Like for this one here, uh, we always want to rely on, this is a historical image. We don't know, I didn't know who the photographer was. What we would do incorporating part of it was as part of a filing, uh, file name system that I we had developed when I worked at the Virginia Pilot newspaper in Norfolk, Virginia. We always used the photographer's name, subject, and then incorporated the date. And that's how we sort of incorporated here. Many of our images would have a file number. Uh, many of the construction images will, will have that. So we incorporate the initials of the photographer, file name, a number if we know that, uh, the subject, and then the date. And that's how we structure our our slugging convention for our images. Great. And, and then in terms of your your folder structure, um, would you click on galleries to show us how that is organized? So kind of showing like the yes. the way. Okay, we're, have... broken in, we're broken into uh, part of our our mission for DWR is the, our, part of our key elements, and we part of our main collections are broken down to a animals, conservation, environment, events historical imagery, people, recreation, science, state water project. Within state water project, there are actually 72 different galleries. Uh, and those are broken down to our different facilities within the state water project. And for example, is if I get to um, under dams, uh, you broke down to each individual dams and then under Oroville, we have all these other different galleries. And uh, the next section I'm gonna be talking about is related to the incident in, in Oroville. Um, the most recent incident was the Oroville spillway incident in February of 2017, which forced us to change how we capture these events and provide critical information to the public and to our own engineers. In January and February 2017, some of the wettest months on record, the Feather River uh, watershed, which feeds Lake Oroville, in fact, the reservoir received an entire year's average rainfall in just 50 days. During this unprecedented weather system, DWR's main spillway was damaged. The damage and erosion of the area forced evacuation of downstream communities. After the threat had passed, DWR engineers and crews got back to work on the reconstruction of the main and, and emergency spillways. The construction continued through 2017 and 2018 and finally wrapped up with the first use of the new reconstructed spillway in April of 2019. Our photographers and videographers were the only uh, visual makers on the site to capture all that work. We also posted image onto our Pixel site on a daily basis from Oroville as we staffed photographers at first seven days a week then to five in the last year and a half, three days per week. Libris was actually a godsend to make sure our visual assets were available to the media, engineers, educators, and the public without a single hiccup. During that period, we had over 11 million page views from all over the world. Our photographers also shot 
hundreds of aerial drone over top of the spillway areas, actually saving us thousands of dollars compared to traditional helico uh, helicopter flying. New terms became part of our vocabulary while covering Oroville. The lower, middle, and upper chutes, which were the different sections of the 3,000 foot long spillway, RCC, which is the roller compact concrete to fill the, in the erosion area between the upper and middle and lower chutes, controlled blast, which were to break up the concrete, cleaning the bedrock. Every little loose rock had to be removed from, uh, from, the, uh, from the site. Structural and level concrete. Uh, the secant wall, which is a 1,450 foot long wall built about 700 feet down from the emergency spillway to ensure erosion would never happen. Stay forms, splash pad, finish work, and cleaning the bedrock. A, a grand total of 612 new concrete slabs were installed. 204 new concrete walls were installed. The project cost $1.1 billion and $330 million have been reimbur uh, reimbursed by uh, FEMA at this point. Uh, the emergency uh, spillway uh, with the RCC splash pad was, was completed on, on October 26 in 2018 and crews placed approximately 700,000 cubic yards of RCC on the splash pad. The design capacity of the new main spillway is, is to handle 270,000 cubic feet of water per second. And here's a drone picture sort of at the finish of, of the project. The splash pad is almost like a stair-stepping effect so that if the water would cascade ever again over the emergency spillway, it would dissipate the energy as it would come uh, down the hill. Here's pouring the last of the concrete. And, and then in April 2nd of 2019, the spillway was used for the very first time and uh, with complete success. Another drone image showing that stair-stepping effect of the splash pad for the emergency spillway. And then we added lighting onto the spillway uh, in January of this year. Any more questions about uh, Oroville? We're getting a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think you all have it, uh, trying to keep up over there. Um, I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, how do you make these kind of images available to media partners? Um, you know, I know that especially with Oroville, you mentioned 11 million page views. That's unbelievable on that site. Um, so I know you have a lot of people who need access to those images who either are a part of your organization or are outside partners. So how are you sharing those images with them? How are you giving them permission to access that content? Right. Originally, up until uh, about two months ago, we required uh, for uh, people who wanted to download image to, to, to sign up to our site. And um, that was just part of a, a policy had been applied from a previous digital asset management system that we had used before Libris. And it was just gonna continue. We just felt like that was just sort of the normal process. And we would make sure that uh, when the media were needing our pictures from Oroville, we would three times during the day, we would make sure if we had new signups, we got them into the right download group so they could access our images. But in the last three months, we have completely opened up our, our uh, Pixel website uh, for downloading. You don't have to sign up. You can just go to the site and start downloading as needed. And uh, so pretty much it's, it's open. And uh, we do have backside images for our own internal purposes, but uh, the, the public side is open with no signups required. And uh, during the Oroville situation, like I said, we would we periodically would check. We would get these random calls. Uh, uh, I mean, we literally had hundreds of media all over the world uh, signing up so they get access to the images. We actually found our highest through analytics. Uh, we found our highest traffic was between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. our time, which for many of us, we were just getting to work. But it was because people in Europe and the East Coast were accessing our images. They were wanting it for their news cycle, the latest images. We would have our photographers would send pictures uh, and I, from home. I would 
edit those uh, photographs and I would move them up through the chain. We would vent those photographs at 11 and 11 o'clock and midnight at night. I would get the approval which ones we could po uh, po post on our website. And by six o'clock that morning, I had them available so that people would access those. So it was almost like you're working for a, for a news agency uh, uh, through a news cycle on a daily basis. We were formulating those images from the photographers traveling to Oroville, I mean, and, and then getting back to their location, processing the images and working through those images um, and then editing them down to what would be our core best of the, of the day and then uh, venting those and then moving them up to be for the world to, to access. Amazing. That's the whole history of that whole Oroville yeah. situation. It was, it was pretty intense. Day and in, day out, it went on for seven days a week. That's amazing. And a great follow up from Sarah. I love this question. As a former newspaper photographer and your team, former newspaper photographers, also shout out to your team. I know a lot of them are on the call today. So if anybody wants to chime in, please um, go ahead and let us know you're here in the questions box if you have anything to add. Thank you guys for being here. Um, Sarah says, as, a, as former newspaper photographers, how do you balance allowing media coverage or media on site um, versus providing your own photos. I know you guys, a lot of the time, are providing photos to media partners, right? Yes, we are. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll, later on, as we get to the toward the finish, my uh, um, little dog and pony show here that we'll uh, <laughs> talk about how this uh, yesterday was the last snow survey of the, of the year, and we were the only uh, media allowed at the event, and we provide the imagery for all kinds of different outlets and and like the Oroville situation. So when we're in an event where the media is there in general, let's say the Associated Press or the Sacramento Bee is there or, or the San Francisco Chronicle or the local television stations, uh, we're capturing our images. And it may be a smaller publication, it may not have the staff to be able to send a photographer, especially since newspapers have shrinking. It's become more and more a reliance on us to provide imagery because staffs have uh, shrunk in the in the downward spiral of newspapers, uh, and many of us are casualties of that, and uh, that's why yeah. I'm here at uh, for DWR is uh, use the you know, the talents that we've learned in newspapering and, and apply it to state government, and uh, so we are a greater resource for smaller publications who can't afford having photographers uh, in an event. So. Um, that's great. We capture what we need, and we also, because of our journalism, capture those, what we would think would be for the general public. Yeah, and I think that allows you to kind of control the story, too, you know, control the narrative about your brand, which is great. Um, we're getting a ton of questions about what your library looks like. So I know that we're looking here at your public portal, um, but people are super curious about how you organize a lot of that stuff on the back end. I think for you guys, because so much of your content is public, it's probably about the same, right? It looks the same on the portal as it does on the library. Yes. I mean, right now we are uh, most of the imagery that we have. I mean, for internal purposes, it may be for our own internal public relations issues that we would need imagery. Um, and then there are some issues that we, because our facilities have to be vented because of security issues, um, some of our images have to go through a vending process to determine if it's a security risk uh, facilities on the state water project. So those are not available to the public at this point. So we had those some on the backside as we have uh, security people looking at those to determine if they are, like I said, available for the public to see. Let me continue on for these final two phases. Part of our DWR mission and part of it is, is education and informing. And here's a, an example where DWR sponsors events. Uh, here's for uh, teaching children the importance of uh, wearing life jackets. And this was an event that we had at uh, Lake Deval uh, in uh, near Livermore, California. And uh, uh, like I said, we're involved in that. We also, uh, many of our public affairs uh, staff will volunteer at the state uh, at the state fair, and here during Kids Day, helping out with kids to understanding saving water and and uh, finding uh, uh, plants and things that they can use for uh, drought tolerance. Uh, and then also we have uh, our, our fish hatchery on the Feather River, which is just down the river from Oroville Dam and they can see salmon. 
Uh, also, many of our facilities have uh, visitor centers, and here is at uh, uh, a facility at Pyramid Lake in uh, the northern part of Los Angeles County, visiting our visitor center. Now back to the snow survey. I was talking about that earlier. Uh, what we an event we covered yesterday. We've snow surveys in California actually started in 19, uh, 1929, and our photo units started photographing it in 1958 uh, here in the Sierras. Uh, and this survey is is really to provide the snow depth and the water content that is within the within the snow. And this is so they can forecast the water runoff in the spring in, into the water into the watersheds of California. And for the last uh, multiple decades, we all went to this uh, particular location at Phillips Station, which is about 7,000 feet up in the Sierras, about 90 miles east of Sacramento. And um, this gentleman here, Frank Gerke, uh, he was uh, he led this uh, event and led the snow survey group. And here he is uh, calculating final uh, numbers uh, from a survey in 2013. And now a new generation of guys have taken over. And here's an event that we photographed in uh, January, um, during the snow survey. Uh, and in February, we do it, like I said, toward the end of each month. Just to transition, the event that happened yesterday, a uh, snow survey, um, our social media folks within DWR's public affairs unit, uh, we uh, we provided imagery for that, and they here it is on uh, Facebook, uh, the event, and here it is on Twitter, showing the pictures that we captured. Uh, our photographer Kelly Grow made these images. That's part of the imagery from from Twitter, and then uh, the San Francisco Chronicles website uh, uh, used our imagery, and they captured an image that was made last year, uh, showing the amount of snow capture at the same time, uh, which was actually on May 2nd in, in 2019, showing the amount of snow that was on the ground last year, which was a, an amazing snow year, and then what was captured yesterday by our photographer Kelly Grow, the contrast between one year to the next. And that's how we're able to uh, provide imagery that goes out from our website, uh, Pixel, and that the media is able to, to gather. Amazing. We're getting a lot of comments on how amazing these photos are too. So shout out to Kelly and your whole team. And these images are really amazing and it's great to hear the stories behind them too. One of the other DWRs uh, is this uh, research vessel that uh, that goes to capture water samples. And here is, uh, we were there capturing that just uh, the 1st of March. Uh, but we've been capturing water sampling uh, since 1957. Uh, uh, here is capturing water samples from groundwater um, in the San Joaquin County area. Last year, we were, there were algae blooms uh, would show up in some of the reservoir, and this was at San Luis Reservoir, which is a federal facility but operated by DWR, and we were they were capturing uh, water samples here. Also, we have uh, environmental scientists, and they. Here they're involving tagging a striped bass uh, to measure it and involved with predator uh, a predator fish project. And also near that same area is uh, is the Delta Fish Protective Facility, uh, and we are they are there to um, rescue fish and up to fifteen thousand fish are saved each year and returned to the Delta waters. Also part of DWR's mission is to restore, uh, and here we're at, uh, we have actually a brother and sister uh, planting native high marsh grass uh, just only a few months ago on a volunteer day at, at Dutch Sleuth uh, Tidal Habitat Restoration Project, which DWR has been involved with restoring over 1,200 acres to be a tidal marsh for the perfect uh, environment for salmon and other fish and wildlife. Another project during the drought of 2012 and 16, the DWR was involved in, in providing uh, the encouragement for rebates. If people would remove uh, their yards, they could get a rebate. And this particular um, neighborhood in uh, suburb of Sacramento, they uh, this, this this family got a, 
uh, up to a thousand dollar rebate if they remove their turf and replace it with uh, either with rock or with ma uh, marsh, uh, with mulch and, and with uh, drought tolerant plants. Uh, so the idea of not having to water your lawn, you could have a yard that would still have beautiful landscaping, but you didn't have to use water. Huh. And then our final section is also is is maintaining facilities and um, here showing example um, where our photographers went down to um, northern Los Angeles County near Palmdale as they had to restore some work on the aqueduct and that work continued uh, day and night uh, and then not too uh, just a few years later uh, not too far from where those previous pictures were made, there was a massive uh, uh, thunderstorm which caused a mudslide to fill the aqueduct, and we were there capturing that. And then also last year, Ken James, who was uh, our one of our photographers, who's now our supervisor, uh, spent over a week uh, with one, one of our videographers inside the tunnels uh, in the Tehachapi Mountains as they were doing inspection and training. And uh, in the middle of January, uh, it was very, very chilly in those, uh, you can imagine in a tunnel in, in the cold water. In fact, uh, Ken James was just called out today. Um, we've, uh, there's a part of the state water project, the Santa Ana pipeline in, uh, has had an issue and uh, he's had to rush off to that area to capture photographs as they were trying to repair that pipeline. Uh, affecting over 250,000 users in that area, and they're told not to use um, the water to uh, using it for external uses. They can use it for their own internal home use, but uh, as they alleviate that problem. So we're actually on call at all times. And, yeah. um, and also part is the training, uh, training preparing. Uh, California has a unique uh, the conservation corps where they, uh, it's a, it's a program for uh, young adults between 18 and 25. Uh, and it's almost like uh, the Peace Corps. And for a year, you're paid to be involved in helping with uh, environmental issues. And here they're filling sandbags. Part of a training is if there ever was a, uh, a flood, that they would know how to prepare themselves for, for that. And then the final part of the State Water Project is we talked about the, the woman uh, uh, the first lady of water and part of her mission was uh, making sure there was uh, fishing and and protection of wildlife and recreation at the state water project. Here is one of our examples of of um, sailboating at uh, Duval Lake. Uh, got swimming available at, at Castaic Lake in uh, in Los Angeles County. We water water skiing at Antelope Lake in the Sierras. This is about 5,000 feet up in the mountains. Water skiing, uh, the, I'm sorry, windsurfing, horseback riding at Lake Paris. And one, one of my favorite historical images that came across, this is on the first day of fishing at uh, Pyramid Lake. Uh, no one's wearing life vests, but <laughs> there's a family who has maxed out their boat, have caught a number of fish and and are showing it to our photographer uh, at that event in August 24th, 1974. And more fishing at one of our, one of our uh, uh, after bay facilities that people can go fishing. And here's a aquatic adventure camp uh, at Lake Pierce where kids have a chance to, to learn about water and safety. Uh, one of our new uh, boat ramps at Oroville and taking a plunge at Lake Oroville. So amazing. Well, we have just gotten so many comments about how amazing all of these images are. It's so cool to see the breadth of your library. Um, and we've gotten a ton of questions. So I wanna make sure that we can get everybody's questions in. Um, we can do a bit of a lightning round. Yoav, you wanna kick it off? Sure, yeah. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but I just wanna uh, jump back into it in terms of, um, Kind of the process from submission how does submission happen um, do photographers upload directly using the Lightroom or photo mechanic plugin or do they uh, come to you first 
and then put it in the library or you kind of you you mentioned editing and and pulling some selects how do you do that kind of the the whole process there if you could speak a little to that right uh if it's a, if it's a new assignment or a, a re, a, basically the photographers uh will self edit uh they may ask a colleague myself or another photographer uh for selections that they may are debating on between different pictures and they will process their imagery through either Lightroom um, and using Photo Mechanic to upload. So some of our photographers use Photo Mechanic to upload, and then some use Lightroom to upload. And uh, once the images are there, uh, they're available for the public. So it's not like a normal formal process, like I, in my old days as a, a picture editor at, at the newspaper, photographers would come to me, we would work together, and they would process the images and then you would pass it on to a designer in that process but here it's a collaborative environment with uh the whole staff we will go back and forth with each other asking hey would you like this photo you like this one and from there they will process the images and work up their own metadata uh from caption writing to adding the tag words and all the information from county to the state um and all the vital information that would require part of our SOP uh, here at DWR. Awesome. Yeah, actually, that's a, a great place to leave off. There's a few questions about um, migration. And well, you said that you started with uh, Libris in 2016. So just kind of what was the process around um, finding the budget for Libris? Um, also, the actual migration process, moving from um, your old, uh, whatever you were using before, over to Libris, the actual files, kind of that whole uh, workflow. I think if you if you could speak to that a bit. Right. We had previously with a previous uh, provider, and um, we uh, knew our contract was coming up, and uh, someone from Libris contacted one of our uh, one of our folks in public affairs. Uh, they forwarded me the email. Uh, process was we had a trial period. And actually, I would say Libris really worked with us uh, through a state agency. Getting the funding uh, took longer than anticipated, uh, but uh, we signed up. Uh, and uh, the previous uh, dam provider that we used uh, actually charges quite a bit more, and uh, Libris provided us uh, the right uh, the right number. We felt, and we and we just felt the, the simplicity intuitiveness i mean uh, it, it just became so obvious to us we did some trial runs with uh, particular key people within uh within the public affairs and then other people that were big users of our of our site and uh, from that we determined that uh, uh these guys were the ones we wanted to have to be our provider and uh, um it's it's been it's been good been good I know we're psyched about that and really loving these photos. So uh, making me want to go to California. Sure going through our, our collection, our gallery of, of birds, and you can see uh, we have all kinds of of, of bird imagery. It's beautiful, is amazing. This question is actually uh, maybe for Kristen. Um, just in terms of on the Libra side, um, someone wanted to know what do you call the libraries available only to the enterprise users or uh, versus the ones that are open to the public? Um, is this an option for all libraries? Kind of how does that work if, if you're able to speak to that a bit? Sure, so every Libris account looks different in terms of permissions. So it's completely up to you whether your galleries are only shared with your internal team or are opened up to the public like this. And then there's sort of that middle ground of if you want certain people to have permission, you can grant permissions through a password or by inviting certain people to those specific galleries instead of giving them access to everything in your library. So it's very customizable. You can have an unlimited number of collections and galleries. Um, so it's very easy to just kind of divide up different sets of content. and. Uh, make those available to whoever needs them and block them off from anyone you don't want to have access to that content. Uh, obviously, you know, this team has opened it up to the public and that's great. Some teams have nothing open to the public and everything is by permission only. So it's really up to your own team's needs and, and you know, how you want to use the images. 
Cool. Um, I think we have time for maybe one last question. Um, Kristen, I'm going to sh- uh, shoot, shoot it back to you just to kind of take us out here. But, but Bill, do you guys accept images from the general public to populate your library? If so, so any, I guess, crowdsourced images, that kind of stuff. If so, how do you educate the photographer on how to make that contribution uh, follow your standards and requirements? Uh, we have we have taken imagery from other DWR uh, staff members who maybe be are like an amateur photographer. Um, and I don't know if I can find it very quickly here. If I can find it um, during uh, the Oroville work, one of our engineers, it actually might have been a contractor, made a, an amazing photograph, a time lapse picture. All right, hold on, Bill. I'm going to have to send it back to you. So, yeah, okay. I, we had handed I jumped, it off to I you. jumped the gun a little too early here. <laughs> All right. Back to my screen? screen? Yep. Yep. We're back to you. All right, here. Um, and made this amazing photograph from, from Oroville. And I'm trying to see what part of. But it was. So you it do- was Oh, here it is. This is an this is a wow. time lapse exposure made from the from the spillway. Wow. This guy is not a uh, is not a staff photographer, uh, but he set up a tripod and pointed toward the North Star and captured uh, a time lapse from the middle shoot of Lake Oroville uh, main spillway. And it's just an amazing photograph. He was a guy that came to us. Um, and uh, we put it on a pixel, and uh, so we will take images. We've uh, we've had some other staff members that weren't photographers that shot some aerial photography over Oroville, uh, but we would vent that. We would look at it to see if the content is strong enough, if it has enough value uh, to us internally and also to the public. And uh, it would be no different than if I was working at the newspaper and a, and a external person came, hey, I got this photograph. And we will take a look at that. So, cool. That's Thank you so works. much. If I could just say one, if I could just say one for, final thing uh, for myself here, uh, working for DWR since 2015 has been an amazing transition. Like I said, after 30 years working newspapers, to be a steward of such an amazing and important collection of images from decades of dedicated visual reporters capturing California's number one natural resource, water. Today, that mission continues with our team of photographers. Amazing. And you guys are doing an incredible job. It's so cool to see, you know, national history play out in your images just from your region. Um, And it clearly touches so many other people. And so I think that was just an incredible look at your library. We're getting some incredible comments in, in the chat box too. Thank you all for being here. And Bill, thank you so much. And shout out to you and your whole team for putting together this incredible historical record. It's really, really neat to see. I want to shout out some of our other programs coming up. So we have an on, on-demand on version of another Inside Look out today. It's already out um, with the Houston Dynamo. So you should check that out. We're also hosting another webinar next Friday. Join us uh, to, with Sarah Matheson, who's a photographer and one of the founders of Hungry Harry's, which is a startup uh, that produces baking mixes for people who need special uh, allergy baking, allergy-free baking mixes. So be sure to check that out next Friday. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, and as always. You can check out all of our past webinars here at this link. You can find that bit.ly and check out all the past ones and get lots of other examples. We are getting so many thank yous in the chat. Bill, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation and we really appreciate all the time and all the work that you put into that. It was incredible to see all of those amazing images. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.